welcome to Barn Blog. And I think this is also going to be on uh, Rob's channel. So on the right podcast channel, maybe. I don't know. Um, sure. Uh, I'm definitely going to share the video with him. Um, so we today are talking about the recuperation of populism and various ways to package left right allegiances uh, to the general public. Um, and um, I've been I've studied this history. I'm also one of the few people who's it's like me, Matthew Sittman, um, and a couple of other people who were at in any kind of movement right wing ideology on the left who like come comes at it from any sort of experience. Now mine was not very long. Um, it was about That's four years, yeah. you know. Um, mostly during my undergrad and early twenties. Um, and it was getting into paleo conservative circles that, that were precursors to what gets sloppily called the alt-right or a bunch of different movements actually, uh, that scared me out of that. So I went from teenage working class kid who got into zine culture, ended up getting into like gutter gutter punk stuff, went to the battle for Seattle, was not really super impressed by what I saw there. Uh, you know, but I also didn't have a lot of context for it. I was like 18. Um, huh. And then was part of the anti-war movement leading up to the, the second Iraq war. Um, and again, I lived in Georgia. The leftists didn't really come and show out for that during that time. It was after 9-11, and a lot of people were scared. And I got recruited kind of into paleo-conservative uh, right-wing world through people around um, antiwar.com, um, you know, a website that's of really mixed lineage but has some very right-wing uh, heritage and parentage. Um, and did that for a little while, uh, kind of broke from that around 2000, but kind of slowly between 2005 and 2007, mostly initially for, for being horrified by what I was seeing as increasing, like, I would say post-fascist racial rhetoric on some of the, the deep internet enclaves. And this is pre-Twitter and pre-Facebook being dominant. Um, this is, these were in like, live journal forums and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And in real life, <laughs> like, you know, uh, you know, talking to people around the Ron Paul movement and going, oh, some of you are neo-Confederates uh, and stuff like that. Right. <laughs> um, so that got me out of that. But anyway, so that's, that's my background. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, when I was living abroad from 2011 to 2012, there were a bunch of right-wingers who tried to reach out to me, not to rim me back over to the right, at least that's not what they were saying, but to put up a united anti-imperial front because they've heard me say things like, well, my commitment to, to being against U.S. foreign policy didn't change when I moved from right to left, right? So they tried to yes. seize in on that particularly. And early, this was this was pre Obama's second term, um, uh, and they liked the fact that I was outside of the United States. They liked the fact, which I'm no longer, but th there seemed to be a lot of things that appealed to them about, oh, this leftist who was a former right winger who takes a, a pretty strongly anti imperial stance. Uh, they kind of went away though. I mean, there's just the second term of Ob of the Obama administration. They got quieter and quieter, and by by leading up to Trump, you just didn't hear from them anymore um, in my circles. But I was also I'd also kind of rejected doing work for them. Um, so that's that's my history. I'm also scholarly interested in the history of 19th century populism and U.S. socialism um, and how it faded out, the problems that it had. Mm -hmm. um, the the way that it got into cul-de-sacs um christopher lash uh, another leftist who's loved by, by right-wingers and often misrepresented by right-wingers frankly um there's a good 
uh, episode of Know Your Enemy that goes into how he's misrepresented. But <clears throat> is did some was my initial uh, way into that world. Uh, he for his defense of populism late in life, he actually does a lot critiquing it, saying that it has a vulgar understanding of culture and economics. Um, it tends to posit elites and thus is given to conspiracy theories. Um, and when it has no socialist framework to join up with, uh, tends to lose its class base and get weirder and weirder and weirder. He he got he seemed to be more interested in defending um, populist in the end of his life because he felt like they were being tarred as just racialist or that Huey Long was somehow a pre, like a, an American Hitler and stuff like that, which he did not believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, some just reacting to some of the stuff you said, it's a, the, the backgrounds, you know, I, I was never in, um, in right wing circles, to be honest, but um, I was definitely um, in and around the Pacific Northwest during that time of Seattle. I was more based in, in Eugene, mm -hmm. Oregon, doing some other stuff in Portland. But um, yeah, I, I was there and around it. Um, I don't try to oversell, though. I wasn't in like meetings and stuff like that with the unions that were there or, or you know, other. Yeah, me like neither. That. I just yeah. went as an observer, actually, exactly. and, and like participated in the protest because I was there. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We kind of knew what was going on, but also not so much. Um, but with with the, the popular stuff. Yeah. You know, I'm. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. And I also have some commentary um, kind of, I, I, I think talking about the 1800s mm -hmm. and um, kind of having like a, a, a realistic view of what happened because there were, there were good things that happened. And I think that like those need to be acknowledged. Uh, I do also think it's a reality that um, I wouldn't even say bad thing, just, just the mixed nature of it is, is oh, yeah. sometimes glossed over, you know, and sometimes I, I think it's due to just not really understanding it fully. Like you said, you know, academically, I think sometimes it's on purpose, you know, with utility to, to do the same today, you know, when mm -hmm. we're talking about maybe like uh, cross pollination of audiences and, and things like that. But, um, but I, I think that's a good place to, to start, you know, yeah. Someone like Huey Long is, <laughs> he's interesting for a lot of reasons. He, he's a little bit later. But let me ask you, how would you like to, to begin with? Because I, I can start in the 1800s or, or you can go. And I have some very like defined ideas about what happened and, and, and why it, it, it ceased. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I'd like to talk to you about it because uh, my audience yeah. has probably heard me talk about some of this before. I mean, they definitely heard me talk about my background before, but also uh, my, my, my mixed admiration, but pretty strong critique of the 19th century populist movement about why I'm probably in line with you. Yeah. Why it couldn't really do what it wanted to do. Um, but impressive things that they did do. I mean, like, you know, they would, they would fight, <laughs> you know, they were fighting for like sharecropper rights and, and taking over state houses sometimes. Sure sometimes being kept out at gunpoint and shooting back. So, I mean, there yeah. is heroic stuff in this time period that has kind of been bracketed out of history, but you also have to deal with the fact that even the S um, even the socialist party of America had a bunch of factions in it that were racialist. I mean, that's, that's a mm -hmm. fact. And, and the populist um, were even, that's even more so true. Yep. Um, uh, the Knights of Labor, for example. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is people, all good stuff. People kind of know that they, uh, well, they should know that they that their leadership like couldn't muster opposition to the anti-Chinese pogroms. Um, uh, people probably know that the S uh, that the SPA uh, had a kind of. I think incoherent position on Chinese labor in the early 20th century too. That's kind of resultant from a lot of the same people from the Knights of Labor entering the party. Um, uh, I feel like you know the major socialist politician um, Victor Berger, 
uh, split split the bath water on that in a way that's like, oh, we don't condemn immigrant labor, but corvée labor is bad. Uh, therefore, we we oppose, you know, Im- you know, uh, Chinese immigration. And I'm like, that's your logic for that is not. Uh, you're splitting the baby there. <laughs> Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. and I think that that has to be understood, but what's interesting to me is like, you look at something like, I don't know, uh, what is it? The people's party, which is deliberately calling back to mm-hmm. the populist movement, right? Like that's, in fact, I think when I found your show, you were on, uh, I don't speak German talking about that party. Yep, and, my, my mind went there when you were talking about this of like how yeah. is this relevant? I mean, it's just a straight line. Yeah, it's I mean, like they're deliberately invoking the same thing. And I think of certain certain people who I who I think are well meaning, like Conal West, uh or um Chris Hedges. Like, you know, I don't think they're particularly pernicious figures. Maybe you disagree with me, but no, I actually agree. I agree. You know, um I, I, I don't, don't think they were dumb. Yeah. Like <laughs> To put it frankly on this i was like you know it, it's like yeah and, and some it's just like a call it's like you know it's like you, I, you think that for whatever criticisms perhaps the overall intention is kind of right-minded at least you know right yeah and and to be fair they've been kind of quiet as the people's party slack has gotten weirder and weirder dude yeah <laughs> like it's not you can search cornell west twitter and yeah, it ceases to discuss them. Well, yeah. while Door has it like pinned, right? It's an awkward right. situation. <laughs> so, so um, let's get uh, one quick question though. When you were in Pacific Northwest, did you ever encounter the Troy Southgate and the Banna people and the the right wingers who tried to infiltrate Green Anarchist in that area? Because that yeah, happened man. around Eugene. <laughs> so you know, I, I and I've. I have no problem because it's not really something I I would talk about on on stuff I'm doing. But yeah, man, I was um, like like long story short, I dropped out uh, of high school and I was working and um, I met I was going to punk shows. Like I grew up going to punk shows quite literally. I was like 15 when I started going and in New York hardcore, too, because I was close to that. And uh, I met this kid who was kind of like a crust punk and we became friends and he rode freight trains. So we were, we rode freight trains for a while and we ended up out there. Cause that's like where you would end up if you're doing that pretty much at that time. And in Eugene, we did, uh, it, it was, it's, it's, it's like a good story worth talking about. We, we were kind of couch surfing and doing a thing. And we met up with a group that ended up being um i think i'm not even sure but i think it was associated with red cloud thunder mm, okay. and uh but it was like you know looking back on a sketch we, we we had met them behind like some health food store of course and they literally blindfolded us and put us in cars so if we were arrested we couldn't you know backtrack and we were brought out to the woods by by a logging site and uh you know the what you would think, you know, th- this this woman came out of the like, like the woods out of nowhere with dreadlocks and stuff, and just kind of guided us guided us back and and so yeah, you know, we learned about like repelling on the trees and and uh, I wasn't out there long enough to really do anything meaningful in terms of tree sits, but um, definitely some some tooling around with with logging roads and and things of that nature. I guess without going too deep, but. Um, you know, we were, again, just to be transparent, it's not like we were like the core, you know, there are people that, that were out there and mm. um, we, were, we were more tourists along the way, I would say, you know, we were out there for a few weeks and then we got back on trains and started riding again. Mm. Yeah, I tend to think the people who I ask because I'm like, usually people who take this stuff more seriously have had actual encounters with these people in one of the many different forms that it takes. Yeah, um, yeah. There, there was a lot of um, that whole culture at that time was a mis a mismatch of stuff, you know, um, a, a lot of really in your face. And I have I have no pretense to say that I probably was in some situations that I was OK with because I'm a white guy. You know, there, there is uh, I mean, just outside of Eugene, we got picked up hitchhiking. Dudes put us in the truck. We got brought us, you know, maybe an hour. You know, it's a pretty good ride 
shook our hands and the dude had a swastika tattooed on it. And I was like, oh, you know, uh, you know, if I were someone else, this would have been an issue. But the the mishmash of, of those, just everything that was happening at that time, the turn of millennia, it's an interesting thing. But a lot of stuff was was kind of crossover, I would say. And and even out there, um, I wasn't there long enough to get into like deep ideological discussions of people literally around like the campfire. But, uh, you know, I would bet if that had happened, there, there would have been some interesting conversations. But, you know, maybe that went places I wouldn't have thought of. Mm hmm. Yeah. So when you started doing research on the on this whole um, attempt with uh, to to talk about, uh, you know, an allegiance of left and right against elites, the, the, the whole red brown thing there. I I noticed that when I started talking about it, um, there was a strong push from both people I know who are former right wingers and people I know who are leftists to be like, yeah, you, know, you just don't go there. That's that shit lib talking point. Um For and sure. stuff like that. Yep. Um, um and I uh one of the things I, I am doing I'm doing many things is slowly writing a book on Christopher Lash and um I came to notice around 2010 uh that lash was still kind of popular in right-wing circles um that he was being misrepresented by paleo concerns by paleo conservatives almost as soon as he died um and that was the only people really dealing with them he became kind of repopularized amongst people who would later call themselves post-leftists um around 2017 2018 um, and their readings of him were often, I think, made the same mistakes as the paleoconservative readings, even though when, even though these people were claiming at the time to be leftists. A lot of them no longer do so, so the, this confusion is not nearly as clear, you know, as uh, pervasive. Um, and I think that's why, like, uh, Sam Adler Bell and Matt Sitman did that episode as they started realizing oh this has been recuperated but mm -hmm. what i what i noticed was also this attempt to recuperate populism kind of going from right wingers throwing tom frank books at me backwards um so what do you think was going on in the 18th century and why is it so useful for this yeah you know well and it's it goes both ways too um even when I was, uh, I have an undergrad in, in history and, uh, you know, when, when I was going through the American side, I, I, I think that, it, long story short, I think this period's a good utility for people nowadays. I think it's good marketing. Um, but, I, but I do think that there's like a natural draw that, that casts a wide net for people. I think it's, it's American, it's, it's, it can be portrayed as positive American history so that it's not constantly like a negative critique of, you know, racism, you know, class suppression, things like that. You can point back and say, well, these guys were actually good. And I think that that entices people that might not, you know, listen to a negative critique that might have some nationalism or, or patriotism mixed in there. Some of the dogs are barking. But um, I also think that, that long story short, it's, it's 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 like white men with long beards and i think people are drawn to that kind of stuff you know i think that there is an americana to it but a righteous americana that again is is going to get people from maybe the right you know but there's that social justice narrative that you can put into it accurate or not that's going to get people from the left too and I think if we're talking about today, you know, it kind of depends on, I think, who you're talking. I, th I, I honestly am, am cynical of folks. And I think that some people just look at this and say, OK, this is a tool that really hasn't been used or rehashed in this way before. It's going to get me a larger audience. And like, that's all they care about, you know, and then they can talk out both sides of their mouths, not have to defend anything they're saying because they're, you know, this oppositional contrarian force and they can use this old template of populism to kind of lean on and say, this is where I'm, this is the heritage or, or history that I'm coming from. 
and then I also think that there are people that um, use it for more, you know, vindictive reasons or or political reasons, uh, which is kind of long story short, getting everybody together, you know. And I don't wonder too, because um, when I started researching this, much of the the way in which this was approached, especially by the left, and when I when I mean this, I'm talking about what's kind of been happening on the left for a while, you know, but maybe just being arbitrary like Syria, you know, when you start having these these anti-imperialist discussions, and you're saying, well, hold on, that's a, that doesn't sound exactly right, you know, and then COVID and, and Ukraine. And um, so when, when you have these people on social media that that are, it sound, you know, like you're sounding a lot like Trump and, and you're actually on Tucker Carlson sometimes, you know, these kind of folks. Um, I think that there there is this way of creating like an, uh, an alliance, you could say. Yeah. And I don't wonder if people who are, just extremely intelligent, to be honest, and extremely well versed in theory, radical theory and history, approach this early on as as red brown alliance when it might not have even necessarily been so deep. It, it, it honestly could have just been on its face just what populism is, and I, I don't have an answer for that. But I do see a lot of parallels between all the contradictions of what happened in the 1800s, and we can talk about that. And you've already kind of talked about it a little bit. And the contradictions of today and, and how those contradictions can fly because ju just the inherent nature of what populism is and is not. And, and right. we can talk about that, too. But I mean, I, maybe long story short, it's just looking at stuff maybe like Zizek has said, like it's, it's not it's not necessarily a theory. Put it that way. It's not laying out uh, economic or, or social political platform or 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 way forward. It's more of a way of doing things because of that. It's naturally amorphous. I think it drives people crazy uh, when you're trying to combat it for a number of reasons, but maybe in this case, in that it's not, it's not something that can be critiqued like classic liberalism or like capitalism. Uh, that's my opinion. I'm actually, uh, you know, interested to hear what you have to say, but in, in kind of preparing for this and looking at populism specifically, I'm, looking at not only like the populist party and before that the grange and and mm. the farmers alliances um those are kind of like what i think are if i'm like a bernie sanders person in 2016 i'm like yeah my grandfather was part of the grange movement you know or something like that and, and it's it's a patriotic way of being positive about america while also having negative critiques um so, you know, the, like there's there's that component to it that, that I think you can talk about, like the Populist Party, for instance. But then there's also like the Know Nothing Party, right? Or the American Party it came out of the Know Nothings, which yeah. when you look at the platform, it's it's Trump. Basically, you just swap out Catholic, Jewish people with Muslims, you know, undocumented immigrants. The Know Nothing Party, the Second Klan. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean... And admittedly, understanding things like understanding the various clans is often hard because we understand the first clan, we understand the third clan. Uh, the second clan, which is a weird, massive MLM, <laughs> basically, is you know, um, and I'm not making that up. It was a weird multi-level marketing scheme with with rituals that were kind of invented, uh, partly from the, the the mythology of the first clan, uh, but it was an anti-immigrant movement that was based in anti-Catholicism. I mean, yes, it was anti-black, but the, the way the Klan was able to shift from a, or, and it, and I should know it wasn't the same organization as the original Klan, but the way they were able to shift from this, um, basically terrorist army of former Confederates, uh, to a, racist fraternal brotherhood that really hated Catholics, but that every American could get behind was a shift yeah. that happened in the 1920s. Um, and was cynically used even by, even by some liberals as a way to reunite the country and build up a popular mythology and re and reconnect the South after reconstruction failed. Um, uh, one of the things I think about the populist party and the popular party is yeah, you can have a history of people like William Jennings Bryant, and I think we first see this become a concern of progressive liberals 
around Tom Frank and the What's the Matter with Kansas book from, I guess, almost 20 years ago now, um, mm -hmm. when he's trying to explain mm -hmm. why the South and the Midwest went from being stalwart Democrats. And, and I do think people forget this. Like, the Dixiecrats only disappeared in 2000 in most of the South. Like, we think of the South as being Republican forever, but that's just not true. It's actually a very recent event. And so for someone like me who came out of that area, it was like, oh, I was trying to figure out, well, what happened? Like, one, how did the Dixiecrats get so damn racist? And two, why were they able to just change their name from, uh, change the, the letter at the end of their name from D to R, which is what happened? They didn't even get voted out. Like, they just switched parties. Um, and the, the Tom Frank thesis is appealing to that. Um, but what it left out, and I think this is kind of important, is a lot of the battles going on were based in class politics that doesn't exist now. I mean, literally, the classes we are talking about yeah. yep. don't exist now. Yeah, like, that's one of my takeaways, yeah. Like, you don't have massive scares of sharecroppers, white or black, anymore. Like, they, that just is not exactly. a thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and the the semi corvée labor standards, uh, and by people don't know, corvée labor means semi conscripted labor, uh, it's semi forced labor, like the way you can get caught in company towns and the mining towns that were almost feudal in the way they operated with uh, with miners. That stuff has gone too, and a lot of the historic narratives of the American labor movement go back to that time period. But those conditions have they they really were defeated so now you're left trying to explain okay well what happened to the democratic party why are they corporatist shills and and i get that a lot of them are like yeah. I, we're talking the day after no, the, the 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 railroad uh the railroad worker yes like so like yeah, it's good like, time we we get it um sure. but what i find so interesting about this is you have to ignore um, that as the as the, the plight of sharecroppers went away, and 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 unfortunately it didn't get go away because they were liberated. It, it went away because they basically became economically unviable. Um, the economy changed. Yeah, the economy fundamentally changed. I mean, these are the people who become the Okies and the Dust Bowl. That's what. Yep what more or less ends this um and the people who remained in the populist party got more and more paranoid and strange and they became like you just got weirder and weirder conspiracy theories coming out um and they got Move more there. and more anti they got more and more xenophobic and they started to look a lot more like the american party uh, the know nothings, etc. I mean, I was I was just reading on uh, with Daniel Boone, the mayor of Chicago, who is an American partyist, and it's like he, he's the guy who split the Baptist Church too. I mean, he's the uh, um, by being so pro slavery that that a ton of a Baptist had to leave and start a separate convention, and that's one of the root origins of the Southern Baptist convention and the other Baptist groups um, is this thing that happened in Chicago, but how there was a lot of anti-immigrant and anti-black sentiment in there. And there was people who went back and forth between these movements and yep. that yep. gets erased. Um, and I think you're right. People, who, people who see like Red Brown stuff, I think, are often over intellectualizing this because they also are reading it all in a European framework. Um, and yeah. the history of fascism, unfortunately, is a history of a lot of the leadership of fascists being uh, not the base. Actually, then that that's kind of an important thing to say. The uh, the base of fascists tend to be small business owners, uh, the working poor who were not wage labor, etc. The uh, the the intellectual core of fascists tended to be either former conservatives or former Marxists who uh, made some weird allegiance with each other. And that's where like this idea of Red Brown comes from, is that is in the origins of the Italian fascist in particular. Um, For sure. Um, Italian fascist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
the early, you know, the I know that you know national Bolshevism is kind of a joke, but uh, at least online today. But going hard into those early uh, early authors in, in Germany too. I mean, you see when you when you read the National Bolshevist Manifesto or something like that, or Patel and those Nick issues, early authors. I mean, the, the template's there. It's just oh, yeah. you swap out Versailles for NATO and, you know, things like that. And the Volk for MAGA or the people. Um, but, but yeah, you know, I, I, I agree that, you know, a lot of these, some, some of these, the red brown stuff, yeah, comes maybe originates at some point from the left and then gets mixed up along the way with ideas that, um, you know, maybe of like the Volk, for instance, but, and we're, we might be skipping ahead. I, I kind of think, in in my opinion, at least at this point, that's part of the problem with populism as well. You know, that it just so easily lent itself to landing in a spot like that, even if the original intention wasn't set out to do so. Be, very much because of the inherent subjectivity and storyline nature of it. Um, there Again, there is no laid out platform. So there's no trajectory outside of what the demagogue or or even if it's a, a leaderless movement, but um, it, 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 it's it's playing with fire, I think, you know, that it, it can have utility, but can get out of control too. Yeah, I think that's, you know, I, mean, I, I, I think that's why people like Tom Frank get used by people um, like uh, some of the elements in the national conservative movement um, over at Compact Magazine who, you know, we'll hire a lot of Marxists. Um, some of the people around, we, we mentioned the People's Party, which I, I definitely get go say, go back and listen to the I Don't Speak German episode you were on for like how much of a joke that's become and understanding that it's a nightmare. That a lot of people seem to have been played, but no one, a lot of these parties don't have clear platforms or analytics like that's that's what makes them so hard to deal with um and you specialize in a lot of the fourth position stuff um i am very aware of it in some in some ways there's always a bait and switch with alexander dugan and and that stuff because frankly after he lost his university of moscow professor in 2013 uh, for his comments on Ukraine, or 14, I always remember, I forget exactly what year it was. Um, he has been a marginal figure in Russia him, itself. Uh, I, I've i talked to to Eric Dreiser on, on uh, over at uh, Counter Punch Magazine, and he says, well, that misses the point. Yeah, yeah, you know, Dugan's kind of a coffeehouse fascist. Um, mm-hmm. But he's actually, his audience is not Russian anymore. His uh, He's actually aimed... Outside. It's interesting he said that. Yeah, yeah. I know Eric is on that, and and I'm sure he's 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 accurate. You know, he he has contacts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, but I also think too in all of this, and and I think it's important when we're talking about populism as well. Um, I think that sometimes folks who take life mm-hmm. <laughs> seriously, that that actually put effort into learning this stuff, and critiquing I, I i do think that sometimes it's 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 hard to rationalize or it's hard to conceptualize the idea that that jokes and clowns can be significant too you know and like i have no no doubt that that once dugan served his purpose right once, once he served his purpose to whomever that he might have been working with in academia or advising in the state duma you know things like that that he as a person um, came out of, you know, the national, the Bolshevist party there, kind of an underground thing, and that that he was very easily disposed of by the elites. But he, the the ideas that he came up with, you know, in geopolitics or fourth position, again, not cited from that, you know, you're not going to have someone in, in the Russian government say on page 53, but that he served a, a utility and a purpose in putting out there into the zeitgeist, these ideas that they could then be referenced, right? And at this point, you know, maybe referenced to the point that that you don't cite them anymore because it's almost as if it's just, it's just out there. And yeah. then in my okay. personal opinion, that's kind of why he's significant, not him, 
you know anytime you hear multipolarity for example you're yeah. not likely getting it from let's say early night uh late 19th century early 20th century british geopolitical exactly. strategy exactly. or or even free sicaria who used the term uh in the mid aughts um about you know the fact that there was going to be multiple powers in the world and that the u.s needed to take a more moderate position and how it navigated them which uh, you know i think it's uh, for a liberal point fine <laughs> you know um yeah yeah uh, I would be probably more radical than that, but, but fine. I mean, you know, yeah. however, when I hear multipolar now, we know where it comes from. For sure. Like, and, and that's the thing. It's that implicate. I mean, the people's party has the new, you know, version has a whole section about multipolarity on their website. And you're like, yeah, of course they do. You know, be, because that inference, and, and that's what I mean. It's almost like a cultural inference at this point to where you don't need to say Dugan, but that's, the impact that he's had right right and so yeah. when i have you know i have i have russian and, and expatriate friends in russia whenever i mention alexander dugan lose their shit on me because they're like he's not important anymore and i'm like right i'm right. like but he's having an effect here he may be a joke like but i i did notice that some of that rhetoric from the eurasianist camp and even if it isn't from here personally but from the eurasianist camp of united russia was definitely in the Putin speeches um, yeah. in yep. the last five years. Um, yep. For sure. So I think, now what does that have to do with American populism? Well, you see this in American populist movement. You also saw a shift, and this I'm going to be very specific. I, I, I want to make people aware that, yes, I know these people are losers and that they don't, they're not mass movements. I'm gonna go ahead and say that doesn't mean they're not dangerous, right? That you saw a shift around people like American Third Position, um, which was a neo-Nazi group um, in the '90s and aughts, that refashioned themselves as New Revolt and 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 American Renaissance, and started doing and started explicitly reaching out to uh, left wingers. Um, there was also uh, people who did uh, the um, attack the system, who thought that uh, there should be an, an anarchist coalition, even with the furthest elements of the right, including explicit neo-Nazis, to attack the center. Now, those people don't have a lot of sway. They don't. But they did use... Alexander Dugan as their primary theorist to clean up all the Nazi stuff from their rhetoric, um, particularly right before the, the uh, you know, liberals discovered that Richard Spencer and, and altright.com existed. Um, and what happened subsequently, and I, and I say this as a person who would have supposed Marxist Leninist on Twitter yell at me, about how Dugan was an anti-fascist and and me right. going to dig up articles um, where he's literally endorsing post his national Bolshevik period, which people don't generally know about, um, where he's literally endorsing Golden Dawn and, um, and Greece and Casa Pound in Italy, which are explicit mm. fascist movements. Yeah. Um, some of them will use national Bolshevik language. Um, and I was like, so by, by, by anti-fascist, you just mean anti-Ukrainian fascist, right? So you're only focusing on one group of fascists in getting, one country. Now you're getting, yeah. Right. The significance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, okay. That seems very far removed from the U S populist movement, except that you started to see people on the so-called populist center empowering basically Twitter Muppets like Jackson Hinkle to go, to go on and talk about MAGA communism and to try to repopularize weird, weird, very strange conspiracy world post 
post-Marxist stuff from things like Lyndon LaRouche. I did an episode on that now so people can learn a little bit of the history. He's becoming like normalized. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and, and yeah. also these institutes that have been kind of dormant are getting money from multiple countries. Right. Sure. Like like uh, the Schiller Institute, which is being which is being run normalized. Uh, LaRouche Pact, which is doing stuff with the with the stop the steal. Um, and yet you have people who are claiming to be Marxist in this and definitely people claiming to be populist leftist. Yep. Um, yep. And, yeah. yeah. You know, so so. And the and so far the gateway drug that I have seen is exactly what we're talking about is this theory of this theory of American history that people don't understand because let's be honest outside of the Civil War and maybe the Gilded Age when you're taught American history we skip most of the 19th century we just skip it like yeah the Gilded it's, Age is yeah it's not <laughs> I uh, it just so happened. When when I uh, went back to school, I was at, I started at a community college actually in in kind of rural North Carolina, and it just so happened that I had a teacher that was interested in this stuff, and that there there were some local connections to this stuff, and so mm -hmm. I think I had like a unique inroad maybe with some formal education with it that um, attracted me to it uh, as well. But you're right. You know, if, if you open up a, a textbook or something, the Gilded Age is like a page and a half and then there's four questions and you move on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and so you might learn about the robber barons are the captain of industry, depending on the mild Democratic or Republican bias of whatever state your textbook is from. Yeah. It goes to the progressive era. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It skips ahead. But, and, you know... And, I, Oh, yeah, it's understanding of it's understanding of progressive era is also shit, but but that's that's a whole different matter. Um, yeah, but I, it's true. Um, but I think I think that's that's uh, that's a that's a key point. I mean, like when someone talks about the, these these figures, yeah, you get the old white men and beards. You get it doesn't. Except for mentioning the IWW and later on the TUL doing, um, uh, and for those of you, your your audience who don't know, I, I think everyone knows what the IWW is, but I don't think everyone knows what the TUL is. That's um, that was the the communist uh, the Communist Party uh, Labor Party that was the I mean not Labor Party Union organization that you didn't have to be a communist to be in the unions that eventually became the basis of the of the C, of entering with John Lewis as CIO. Um so they were pushing mm -hmm. they were pushing um integration of black workers into labor strikes and stuff like that. So people will selectively pick that up but then kind of pretend that was the majority of of the early American labor movement and it absolutely was not. Yeah. Um, yeah and I think so for me Mm. You know, because because we're we went all the way to East. Uh, yeah, we were North. jumping around. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, but I think it's good because I think it actually helps. I, I think as opposed to just being linear, because to you know, for, for me, I mean, I I just I still can't believe Hinkle actually made it on the Tucker. I mean, that's <laughs> but but you know, talking about all this stuff, you know, mm. I, I think that populism is like it's the perfect tool to use for this stuff because of the mixed nature of its history the fact that people don't really know about it um you know we started talking about like the know nothings right because i think that there is there's a left you know there's very much the ability to critique the populist movement from the left and the farmers alliances the colored alliance all the things that you talked about with in, in a positive light and say that even if I'm like a Jackson Hinkle, like that's what I'm talking about. Right. And I think it gets um, the, the, the trouble begins when you leave all critique behind and you start going to the populist message. And this is what people like Jimmy Dore hammer and stuff like it's us versus them. It's us versus the elites. And, and you can reference this period in history and say, these people, the populist party, for instance, they had success. Right. They won seats. They actually won 
electoral, electoral college votes. If you count William Jennings Bryan, I mean, they did it, you know, and this is what we're trying to do. But in order to do it, you have to get over divisions and unite together. But the problem is, of course, and this is where I think the red brown stuff might be misapplied because, I mean, what they're saying is that if you're African American, if you're an undocu undocumented immigrant, if you're, you know, if you're anyone outside of people that look like me, basically, you're the ones that are going to have to compromise because we have to do it together. And other people aren't, right? Because it needs to be, we need to be a united, it needs to be a hegemon, right? But innately in that, there are going to be people that lose out, even if we're saying we're all equal. And that's why I think, like, even talking about the no, like the, the no nothings and then the American party, yeah, they, they were very much, you know, xenophobic. And, and that's what people think about. But they also had labor reform stuff, too, you know? Like, like they had a mixed bag of things in Massachusetts. They had some odd things going on with school desegregation, you know, and, and that's why I think this era is so interesting and applicable today when we're looking at, you know, these kind of people that you want to just say are jokes, but they're not jokes because they're hugely influential. And well, I, even like the populist party, I mean, I think that that's like the original. I think that that's like the perfect party. Because even within the, the populist party, some people, you know, were very much anti-slave. Some people weren't, right? Some people were in the South and they're in farmers alliances and they were fine with, with Jim Crow, for instance. But, you know, even uh, Watson, you know, the VP who with, with Bryant for the populist party ticket, he started out with the populist party and then he ended his career running on white supremacist racist Jim Crow stuff, you know, even William Jennings Bryan himself has this kind of like mixed bag of, on the one hand, anti-imperialism with Cuba. I mean, you know, but then on the other, which was kind of paternalistic, but I mean, whatever it is, what it is for that age. And then on the other hand, being involved in like the monkey scopes trial is saying that evolution can't be taught in schools. But I think. Oh yeah. Biggest, William Jennings Bryant was a, was a hardcore fundamentalist and that is, it, yeah, uh, and I mean that is an interesting thing to deal with because in the in the in the nineteenth century, the the fundamentalist Christianity was not politically sorted the way it is now, like, and it makes it very hard to read and figure out stuff like uh, the William James Jr. Skull Trial. That's that's a great example. Uh, Clarence Darrow is defended by someone like H. L. Minken. Minken um, is a darling of the far right. Um, he was not, I don't think he himself at the time was what died a far, an American rightist. Uh, he was an asshole, but you know, a very, a very productive one. And he actually seemed to move away from his initial racist views. I've read a lot of stuff on him, but it's to like approaching that today. Someone can remix that in a way that you totally can't tell why yep. what's good or bad there. Yep. Um, I mean, you know, the amount of the, uh, you, you have to like, remember, for example, we talked about the, the Dixiecrats, the Dixiecrats are a perfect example of this. They were Star Wars FDRites, even though they were also fighting uh, labor improvements in the South and industrialization in the South, uh, they were loyal to FDR. Um, and that contradiction led to the Democratic Party having a coalition after 1937 yes. of basically neo-Confederates and communists uh, in the same, or at least tacitly working with the same political apparatus. It's very strange. Um, and that's yeah. hard for people yeah. to parse out now. Yeah. Um, well, and that's what we're doing, you know, and right. people just want to hear it, you know, it's, yeah. Um, even, mm -hmm. uh, even bigger though, I mean, like, and then we can get, because I feel pride, but even bigger though, that this, and, and, and I kind of want to talk about us versus them, because that's the basis of populist ideology, if you want to call it that, but even looking at the most successful, because I think the populist party would probably be, if we're looking at people that got into office, you know, the most successful in the United States manifestation of, of populism 
you know, what like fundamentally, materially, what what changed? You know, like what actually came out of that movement? And and then I think it gets into third party stuff, honestly. But I mean, what happened was it, it was a third party that fused with the Democrats. And like, let's just stop right there. Like, just stop right there. Like, who were the Democrats in that time? You know, and I think that that is like a perfect analogy for people today who are talking about the the modern folks that you're talking about, or even the modern People's Party. McKinley wasn't a great, you know, human being in 2022. You know, his statue got tore down in San Francisco because of imperialism, which is interesting, I think, actually. But yeah, fair enough. If you know McKinley's history, actually, he was a very late goer to imperialism and opposed Teddy Roosevelt for a long yeah. time. But yeah, but I know well, that's a historical nuance people don't know. So in context, though, I mean, just let's just keep mm-hmm. it macro. I mean, he was in the Republican Party. You right. Know? And, and he was the Republican Party, whatever you want to say. It was Lincoln. It was Reconstruction. So, you know, th- this populist party that people are referencing today as some type of uniting force. I mean, ultimately, after all the oration and speeches and stuff, which is inspirational and stuff, you know, but ultimately they sided with the party of slavery and they fused with it. Right. And, and the height the height of all of this was under Woodrow Wilson because Brian got into his administration. And like everybody knows the contradictions with Woodrow Wilson, right? Yeah, uh, they do now. I mean, although I will admit American liberals did not admit the contradictions of Woodrow Wilson until very recently. Like when I was in high school and in college, I still had people praising uh, good, good stalwart Democrats who were Clintonite praising the, the, the League of Nations as a, as a great bit of humanity. And I mean, in some ways, yeah, sure it is. The predecessors of the UN, I guess, now the UN's done a great job, but um, I get why they think that, but you have to completely clean everything. The he, KKK. Yeah, the <laughs> Klan, you had to ignore the fact that he actually, that he made the federal government more discriminatory than, than yes. the Hardy administration. Uh, yeah, man. You know, I mean. But, but I mean, like, I, I feel... And, and this was kind of an aha moment, and maybe it's over-exaggerated, I don't know. but And it's not something I've thought of for very long. It was looking at this. And it feels like people on the left today have this like gut in, intuition when they're looking at this stuff, especially on social media, and they're like, this is BS. You know, like this is like right-wing stuff dressed up in left-wing stuff to try to trick people or, or whatever, you know? And, mm-hmm. and I feel like it gets analyzed – you know, and, and these are smart folks, but when you just look at like, what, what are they referencing historically and what happened? You know, if you're, re- if, if you're calling yourself the people's party, I mean, keep it simple. You're calling yourself a party that merged with the pro-slavery party. And this is like the us in this, right? right? Versus the elitists. And so and who's they the didn't side with the, and, and this is important to point out, they did not side with the SPA, which had a candidate that was imprisoned by yeah. by wilson yeah 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 I so mean, like it, it's, you know th- these contradictions and, and and even like and the and the the, the ideas of anti-imperialism too it, it just you know to me is like because you look at you know whatever gray zone or blumenthal and, and these and it's the same thing i feel like people intuitively know what they're looking at is bs you know they're like Okay, like I, this is like some red brown stuff, you know, but there is outside of this, uh, like a radical theory critique, there is just like plain history, you know, that that kind of supports this stuff in the 1800s. I, you know, Will and the the, uh, folks were talking about Bryant himself is like a good example of that, uh, of this, this mixed legacy. But I think it's that mixed legacy, again, that, you know, if you're critiquing this today and what's happening today, if these people are referencing that, I think the critique needs to be what are the intentions, you know, because the intentions are clearly whether it's kind of like cartoonish, like MAGA communism or whatever, or or whether it's more nuanced of saying, well, you know, let's talk about structuring horizontally along class lines and neoliberalism, neoliberal wokeism is separating us or trying to intellectualize it in a way like that. The goal is to try to convince leftists that they need to unite with people on the right, you know, and so that's the 
critique, I think, of under of, of saying why, you know, like is is this actually what they think? Is this trying to you know just convince people on the left to move to the the right? Like, what's what's the goal in in this? You know, and, and I'm obviously very cynical of of why they're doing, but this is how it to me it gets into this stuff like. We we're talking about Dugan and it, it's a it's a united force against the hegemon. And they're just defining the hegemon as neoliberal or democrat or progressive, uh, whether it, it, that's that's kind of domestically. Globally, you could say like the West or NATO. And that's how you have people defending, you know, like what's happening with Russia. But it's it's to me, it, there is a through line and maybe it's a thin one, though. But there it, there is this through line of. There's like a project in place, you know, and, and the history shows you what happens when when that project's implemented. And of course, later, too. I mean, there's lots of other examples. But if you're literally referencing the name, that's what happened to the name. Right. I don't know. What, what do you think about that? Well, this. This is what actually, you know. I think I come out of probably far left circles and some of the people who are in my circles actually do, do talk about like wokeism against as a neoliberal project. And I, mm -hmm. I've always been hesitant on, on jumping on that train for a couple of reasons. Um, I don't know what wokeism is. You know, I, I actually really don't. I do know that, that there are pernicious things like say diversity statements at universities where you have to have a lot of privilege to to build the CV to write the diversity statement and it's not really changing the average black or brown person's life. That's that's real. Um, yeah, that's also a very niche thing, a very niche concerned in high level academia. It's a problem. It's a real problem. It's HR talk. I get it. What I find fascinating, I, and this is not Red Brown. I think this is this. However, is sort of a a psychological template for what's how this starts in a lot of people is, you know, I talk about uh, PMC on PMC violence and a lot of people complaining about the professional managerial class. And I'm going to asterisk that I, everyone who, who talks to me about that tells me, well, you know who they are. And I'm like, yeah, but why can't you just tell me who they are? Is it everyone with a degree, any degree, which right. degrees? Is it just people on the top 20% of income who are still wage earners? Yep. Is it, people who work in the service sector? Uh, is it people who are not productive in that they don't build physical commodities or work in logistics, which by the way, is only 13% of the developed world's population anyway, um, and not the poorest paid part. Is it, you know, who are you talking about exactly? And who are the elites? Because the elites move from you talking about Madeleine Albright to you talking about some blue pair of uh, um, barista that you have a problem with who works at Starbucks. Like, yep. like you're just yep. moving the goals around. I never know who you're speaking about. Same with wokeism. Like, yes, there is there is liberal a recuperation of anti-racist tropes. Totally real, totally true. But who which ones are we speaking of? Like, there are many that I that I do that I personally detest. We may disagree on this. I actually don't know your politics on this stuff. But mm -hmm. But um, what I always think it's interesting because a part of me is like, well, it's blah, 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 neoliberalism. I'm like, well, if you want the working class to unite, you have to ask why there's so many divisions. And actually, uh, uh, your listeners, I don't know how many of your listeners are Marxist, but I, I make a big deal of this because it's not it's, it's racial stuff, but it's actually not just racial stuff. It's sectional. It's regional. There's uh, gender and sex issues. Um, there are uh, ethnic chauvinisms you have to deal with. There are wealth gaps, even between white people, you have to look at and analyze. And you can't just say, well, if we're all in this together, you can't talk about this because, one, you actually have to materially address a lot of these concerns before you actually can ask people to be all in this together. Um, and two, when I also don't know who the elites are that you're attacking and that and and that can be code for so many different people and different things, I also have no idea who I'm actually asking to appeal to to coalesce against said elites, right? Yeah, that no, yeah, yeah like who, like who? like yeah. that's the danger. <laughs> um, 
And, and I think we need to get to that. It almost, you know, and to be honest, I don't know the politics of my listeners. I, I, I try to keep it somewhat, you know, open, mm -hmm. but I don't think that, you know, how can I say this? There's something disingenuous about, you know, uh, telling somebody that we understand that there's, there's, there's a social aspect, you know, to the racism that you face and it manifests in political ways, whether it's, you know, like voting rights, for instance, access to uh, medicine, or perhaps the way that doctors prescribe medicine to you and treat you, you know, very nuanced things like that. I think it's disingenuous to say that, you know, we're, we're all going to be in this together, especially if you're asking me to work with people who are openly reactionary. And, and that's the part that gets glossed over in these and, discussions. And, and not know. asking those open reactionary people to change. Like this is, they don't this have is to, thing. they right. don't have to, they have the right. social, yeah, they, they are the norm. You know, they're the normative force. They have the, the economic, political, social power, whether they want it or not. It's just, it is what it is. And I'm talking about like myself in this. I'm not, they're not the enemy. It's just the reality, you know? Right. So that, and, and that's kind of like getting back to like the, the historical piece of the populism. I think that the, there is looking at the history is useful because it shows you what happens when you take something as amorphous as me, us first, the elites, which is what populism is. And, and we, we can get to maybe like more people have tried to build theory around it in like the eighties and stuff. But if we're ultimate, if that's the ultimate story, right. You're de facto disenfranchising people and telling them that you just need to suck it up because perhaps ultimately in the end, we'll have a policy gain that will help everybody. And that, the, it just doesn't, it doesn't sit right. And, and there's a lot of, you can't say that, you know? And, and so that's why you have all of this stuff going. You have, you have all these things on social media and stuff talking incorrectly portraying, like for instance, what happened with the populist movement or with like the black Panthers and young Lords and like things like that, because they're trying to, they're trying to present this as a method, as a way forward. But I just have to think that, this is actually just a right, it's a right wing, it's inherently right wing. You know, th that's, that's the normative mean to which everybody is having to move to. And, and the reward that you get for, for doing so might be, I don't know, Medicare for all, let's say, you know. But if you are in like the colored alliance in the 1880s or, or even earlier and, and you knew about like the greenbacks and like all these other kind of third parties and then, you know, you're, you're seeing some people write some good stuff, some some oration. They're saying, I'm going to go with the populist party, let's say, you know, I'm going to I'm going to vote for them instead of Republicans. Ultimately, they merge with the Democrats, you know. And so I just see this like that this overlap of that, of it's it, at, at populism. It just feels like in the United States, I think it's different if you're talking about colonial, you know, and maybe like the global south. It, it, those are different situations in Europe. But in the United States, it just naturally, by default, moves to the social norm, which is what we think, capitalist, white, you know, patriarchy, all, all these things. And that all those other grievances are kind of pushed to the side. And I also just don't think maybe, maybe if we, you know, because I'm referencing the, the past, maybe we're done with that. But I also just legitimately don't think that the what happened with the 1800s was a success of us first now. I mean, I think that the truth is just much more boring. I think the truth is that the, there were economic changes with like bonanza farms and industrial farming that were disenfranchising mm -hmm. small farmers who just happened to be a very large portion of the, the uh, culture of that time. So there's a natural force that was uniting these people. There were economic crashes, a panic in 19 uh, or 1893 that made ideas of deflation, inflation, monetary policy central, which might not have otherwise have been. Sounds so familiar I, I to think, now. Yeah. <laughs> I think there, there are exterior factors that legitimized what might not have ever been anything. And I think that that's, that's kind of how you got, you know, the, the goal of cross speech. That's how you get the Democratic Convention. That's how you get William Jennings Bryant. And that's how you get people today, you know, who could say like, look, MAGA aren't reactionary racists. As a matter of fact, they're anti-imperialist or something ridiculous like that. 
and saying what we need is like MAGA communism. And they did it in the past, you know, and the neoliberals, they don't get it and stuff like that. I, it feels like that's where that, that rhetoric can come into play. I think maybe, you know, to be specific here, um, because it's, it's interesting. Um, I think you might find my stance on, say, the Democratic Party maybe a little alienating because I, I see cons- I see movements to build a third party outside of that as somewhat fraught, um, given the long history of, of American social. In fact, I've said that like the best that any of these movements have ever achieved is to be merged with one of these two parties. Well, that's um, a reality. I mean, right. you can agree or disagree, but that's what happened. And there's constitutional reasons for that, for that frankly. Like, structural reasons. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like, like there, and there's economic incentive reasons. There's, there's, there's force of scale reasons. Um, if you want to be outside of partisan politics, you have to honestly be outside of partisan politics. Like, yeah. and, and you can't. And then if you're doing that, you can't make it a call of, well, let's all unite Earth versus them because you have no political means to do that. Like, I will admit, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm not a partisan. Um, I don't like any party in America, including all the third ones. But um, I also realize, and you won't hear me say stuff like, don't vote, because, because you... <laughs> it's... If it doesn't, if it doesn't matter the way people and some of these uh, third party movements are adjacent say, then it also doesn't matter if you do it. Uh, and if it does matter, then voting your interest, and I mean yours as an individual, uh, and your morality, and I mean yours as an individual, is smart. And shaming people for doing that is bizarre. Um, can particularly when you're when you are offering something that there's no structural history for it being successful in this context. It starts. It um, sounds like a scam, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Like because I mean, um, if you're asking people, say, well, we got to all fight this together, join my party that we're, oh, we're also only starting um, with the national elections. We are not building regional power bases. We aren't trying to build up uh, parapolitical groups to change state laws to make this more possible. No, we're, we're going straight forward for the presidency. I don't know why people are fooled by that. I really don't. Um, because it's yeah. like, you have to be completely oblivious to, to the, uh, to the federated nature of U S election law to think that that would ever be successful. Um, I think it's exasperation more than anything else. Hmm. You know, I don't know that there are many people who truly think even the heights, I mean, the heights of this Ross Perot, Ralph Nader, you know, in the modern era, ever really had any any opportunity to do anything but disrupt. But you know that that gets complicated because then you get into kind of you know people can do what they want, you know. But but I agree that you know, it, <laughs> there, my 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 when it comes to electoral, I kind of view things of like there's a lot of different kinds of politics, and electoralism is one piece of that. But it's not mm-hmm. everything, you know, and I kind of think if we're looking honestly at the history of populism and, you know, I, I, I feel like I've kind of been dumping on it a little bit. Um, I, I think that the positives, if we're, if we're looking at what could be learned, I think that the positives of that are the horizontal uh, decision making and ability to um, organize in that time period. And mostly probably with the Farmers Alliances and the Grange and things like that. Like, I think that that's a huge success. And it's something that you can use as a template for community organizing, for protesting, for activism. Um, But I don't really see an electoral story in there at all. And it does. 
when people try to make it so, right, and maybe whatever, like the modern people's party, whatever, it, it does reek of, of grift to me, you know, and, and being disingenuous um, and maybe, you know, taking advantage of people <laughs> as well that really do have good intentions. Um, but it's not just them. I mean, I, I don't want to get into a thing of like bashing third parties, but I, I've had, uh, you know, mixed experiences with many third parties as well as the Democratic Party too. Um, talking to folks I've been involved in and talking about, you know, local groups and, and things of that nature, all the way down to like the Sunrise Movement and, and Progressive Wing to Bernie Kratz, all that stuff. Um, but especially when you get into like the Green Party or, you know, uh, some of the more. Uh, uh, when I was a right winger, I was in the Reform Party. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it does. After a while, after a while, you're like, there's a hierarchy, big fish, small pond. It's a grift. It, you know, is self perpetuating. But where is the what, what? What is it that you're accomplishing? You know, and and that's kind of the story of the populist. I feel like I, I feel like the organizing was great, but then once it became electoral, it just is a third party discussion of merging with a racist party and you know, some stuff that they advocated for happening down the road, but it was because the third parties co-opted it, which is like a civics lesson in how third parties are watchdog groups kind of. And right. and if that's the big thing, fine, you know, but that's not how it's being portrayed by, you know, people I think who are purposefully being disingenuous today. Well, I, yeah, I think that's, that, uh, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, I think there's two good points here. Um, one is if you want, let's say left unity or broad working class unity would, would pick whichever unity you want. Um, you do have to address people's grievances and all sides have to change. And frankly, the sides with the most power have the most to change. Like that's, that's the most basic assertion. If you that's say, yeah. yeah, if you say, <laughs> That you can do that, we should all join this together, but nobody has to change themselves, make any compromises, people don't have to change the way they interact with people, etc. Then, what you are saying is those other issues are totally illegitimate, right? That's yeah. Yeah. um, that's what you are saying, um, and that's how you get the right involved. That's that's the meat for the right, right? LGBTQ right. rights, minority right. You know, the, all that stuff isn't really the important thing. It's it's you getting health insurance, and, and and but then that's the that's the meat to the the left of saying, look, we we can force the vote. We we can force these social programs to come through. But again, what what is it? What's the core of of materially? What is it that you're actually changing? What's happening here? Um, I, and, and at the core, it's it's what you're doing is dismissing the need for plurality, which is itself reactionary. And th that's my that's kind of like my stance on that. Um, it's it's I, I feel like kind of like a liberal take on populism. You'll 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 see a lot of people in button down shirts who are talking about how do we co combat populism? They'll 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 say. Well, you know, the, the first thing is that the us versus them is demagoguery. You know, the us is defined not by the people up, but by the top down. But then also this idea of by by the very nature of saying us, you're, you're erasing the possibility for plurality to exist. And that just by social factors and inertia, it's going to move to the mean. And the mean is whatever is the social norm of the power. I think that's... I think that's a fair and important critique, actually. Yeah. And, and this is something that, you know, I know that a lot of my audience is going to listen to this and go like, well, how is this guy not a liberal? Um, and yeah, that's fair. Uh, uh, <laughs> and and I and I might say, you know. Well, whether he's a liberal or not, it doesn't change the fact uh, that. um if you're going to ask people to to be strategically aligned, all right, um, to have solidarity with each other, you also have to ask them to make material changes 
to the way that they interact to make that possible. Because there's a reason exactly. why they don't have solidarity now. Exactly. Right? Um, and you, people who... I think this is this is this weird thing from a lot of these people because they, they'll claim to be like good economic materialist. Um, but then they will, will talk about this as if this is all just a conspiracy by elites to keep us separated. And I'm like, yep, no, we're separated because we can't get along. And there are reasons why we can't get along. Some of them are cultural. Uh, those are, some of them are bigotry. Those are the easiest ones to handle. Right. Uh, you start dealing with systemic problems, systemic norms, long historical things that you can't just fix by changing your personal attitude or having immediate solidarity. Um, these things are, are hard. And yes, there are factors. There are, you know, liberal capitalists who will totally fucking take advantage of that. True. Yep. Uh, going all the way back to Andrew Carnegie, I tell this story all the time, but it's to ask people to just put it down, um, doesn't work. And it's honestly also the people who were successful about this in the end of this time period we're talking about in the beginning of the 20th century, they didn't do that. No. They didn't say unite and fight and black union workers shut up. Right. They, they, Which like, is, <laughs> well, and that's that's the important <laughs> difference. You know, it's it's not saying that you and and, and this is why I, I have I, I I get whatever, like a spidey sense about well, what's your intention? You know, not you, but like, what's the intention when, when you start saying, you you know, when, when you when you start taking something that is legitimate, right? Mm -hmm. Like, let's just say a plurality, like like that's a legitimate thing, you know, and and you start labeling it using reactionary terms like wokeism, right? It, it, to me, that's the first thing of saying, well, what? Well, hold on, like I know you're talking about a policy change or something, but like, where are you really coming? Like. What what's what's the point in this? You know, and inevitably these these the figures, the big you know bases end up on Tucker Carlson at some point, you know. But talking about to an audience, you know, about because it, I get it, you know, you, you can say like I think I think two things that can be true. I think that accepting plurality and accepting uh the accepting an intersectional analysis of things is is valid. But also, it is true that there are Democrats, or if you want to call them neoliberalism, that neoliberals that that use this as a tool to artificially divide people too. I think like both things are accurate. You know, it's just a misuse of a tool that's actually a legitimate grievance. Right. And I think that you know, me, I, I, I would do it like in a story, and you know, I'll keep it brief. But like, I'm like a white dude saying, I don't think I'm like the right person to be <laughs> saying this. But um, in that. In the video that I did about um, we, whatever, it's a lot of stuff. But we talked about Jimmy Dore and the People's Party too. Like Renee Johnston was was in that. She's an African American woman that only votes third party, right? And I mean, to the point to where we kind of disagree about some, maybe a little bit of like what's realistic, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But like her saying, she was fundamental and core to organizing the new version, Nick's version of the People's Party in New York. So like, you know, she was in it, you know, and she said that she had to leave because of the acceptance of passive racism and because of the constant pressure, belittling or ignoring of legitimate grievances of saying, like, I, I came into this as star third party and now it, like Nick is on there supporting like, the convoy in Canada and stuff on social media or, or the page is, is up there supporting like something that door said about like Boogaloo boys or right wing stuff. And like, I'm not aligning with MAGA people. I'm black. They want to actively disenfranchise my ability to do basic things like vote, you know? And so I think maybe that story of like, like she's not a liberal, <laughs> You know, she's a black woman from New York State that tried to set up like the very core foundation of the People's Party in the modern sense with very good intentions, who said, I can't do this because you're asking me to do things against my best interest. Right. 
And I think that that's maybe a good illustrative approach. So that's not just like that's liberal or, or, you know, that's divisive. We need to unite. That's like a very real story. That's, that's legitimate. Well, I think when you pair that, when we talk about what happened at the end of, at the end of this pop uh, of both the progressive and the populist period, because the progressive and populist movements eventually merge all in the party of slavery. Right. Like that's where, like the, the progressive movement was actually a bipartisan movement until, until FDR, but, but pro, they merge into the party of slavery if you have a problem with the way things are now in the democratic party repeating the strategies that created the modern democratic party don't make sense to me like so like that's like so you know you and i may like i said i don't know and um you and i may like have vastly different ideas on the modern Democrats, although it sounds like as we talk, maybe they're not. Uh, but <laughs> <I doubt> but <laughs> uh, but um, for example, someone I'm just going to use an example uh, because like this is literally two days after the 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 railroad strike got voted down off of an obsolete 1920s railroad law that exempts it from the National Labor Relations Board, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If uh, 400 business magnets contact Biden, Biden sets up this vote. Blah, 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 blah. And if you look at the 15 senators who did not vote to force, I'm sure people are seizing on it going, look, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Josh Harley, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, and uh, yep. Sanders all voted the same. I saw if, this. if only we could get the, the national conservatives and the progressives on the same side, we could take the Senate. Not how it works. And I'm just like, do you guys forget who some of these people were just literally, I don't know, a year ago? Like, yeah. yeah. Um, well, this is, it's the us versus them thing, you know? It's, but it's, I'm looking at, I, I'm not sharing my screen, but I'm looking at a, a screen, something I grabbed from Twitter because I, I wanted to bring it up when, when we were talking. And I think it illustrates it well, you know? Mm-hmm. It's someone saying that Trump is, is is a fascist, basically. And the response is, he's not a fascist, he's a populist. Like William Jennings Bryan, Huey Long, Joseph McCarthy. None were fascists, none of them were bad. And, you know, this is when when we talk, when I talk about like the us versus them and the plurality and, and the amorphous nature of populism, which it, which because it just inherently does not have, it's not political theory. It's, it's, it's a way of describing things. It's a messaging tool. It's a way of, of, of mobilizing people. Uh, again, with, you know, the Farmers Alliance and stuff, I think could be very useful in the modern sense. But, but politically, it's, I say it's like playing with fire because it can be pointed in any direction. And, and the template back in high school when you had your graphic organizer, you know, like that template can be applied to any political ideology. And it can be, you know, altered in, in a way uh, in which could be right, left, you know, a little bit of both. But I just have, and and maybe I'm cynical, I don't know. When when I see stuff like what, what you said, because I'm sure there's stuff out there like that. Like, look at Rubio vote. If, it's like, if if you're actually saying, I mean, first of all, if you're saying merging these two things, you're just automatically immediately disenfranchising huge populations of people, like just immediately. But also I think that you're, Naive might be too strong, but maybe, mm-hmm. uh, you know, missing what's actually happening here because there's never these people have no interest in what you are talking about. Um, they actively th- their career is based on stopping it, as a matter of fact. But also, too, in you doing so, it's just such an immense like state of uh, I don't know. I don't want to say privilege, but just complete dismissal of huge swaths of the population that these people actively seek to legislatively disenfranchise. You know, that, that they just can't be swept under the rug because you say like for this individual policy, if they had just agreed. Right. And there's kabuki and there's political theory. There's a reason why just a handful of Republicans voted for it, you know, and we can like, you know, that's a whole other discussion, you know. I have I have ideas on that too. I mean, they need to keep a uh, blue collar base too. They can't just come out and all of a sudden become like neocons in the '80s. So yeah, you need to you need to throw 
a nominal also, if they symbolic make, faction. Yeah. Make uh, the Democratic Party crush a uh, wildcat strike. It's great PR. Of course. Yeah, man. Like, that's how you that's how you convince Mag. That's how you convince the the much you know talked about you know white mm-hmm. blue collar working class people to vote for you, uh, as opposed to Democrats who traditionally in the 20th century had that vote. You know that that's that's Thatcherism. You know that's you know it's it's political strategy. But don't for one second believe that there's actually some type of ideological consistency. There isn't, right? And that's yeah. opportunistic. Well, yeah. To me, this is this is the problem. There's there's two major problems with populism as a category, from my perspective. And I, I'm I'm gonna out myself. I think you you probably knew this about me, because um, you followed my channel a little bit. I'm a Marxist, but but from from my perspective, it all becomes floating signifiers and like people telling you, you know what we're talking about but like yeah but why yeah. don't you just say what you're talking about because if you would just yeah. say it i would know but you yeah. don't and why don't you yeah and if and right. if you're if you're in a situation in which a change if, if you're going to be the first that's negatively affected by something you want to know the specifics first as well you know vagary is not in your it's not on your side put it that way and i i think that like, I, for instance, I, I talked to uh, a fellow who is a, a Democrat, you know, African-American guy. And, you know, a, a, a critique of his and, you know, I, I mean, I voted Sanders and, and things like that. But but his critique of like, why didn't Sanders do well was like, look, older African-American people, especially in the South, they, they have this understanding. Right. They, they've seen this come and go before, but they're still here. And it's you're not going to just convince them all of a sudden that that this person is going to fundamentally change everything and that that change is actually going to help you in the long run. Right. That that because they're going to be the ones or among the first for which the, you know, shit hits if it hits the fan and that they are going to just inherently be against something like that with also this this thing of like, why should why would why should, what have why should they believe you? you know, as well, like what, what, what is, they're the ones with most at stake, let's say, maybe not that particular demographic, but any demographic, right, that, that is going to be the first to, to suffer repercussions. You know, they, they're the ones that you're asking to go out on a limb for you. And what, what are you providing them to, as assurances that this is actually how it's going to go too. It's not justifying voting for Democrats, but I think it's in leftist circles, I think sometimes everything gets dismissed as being wrong as opposed to maybe trying to disagree, but understand where people are coming from too, you know? And, and even if you're looking at the history, you can disagree with, with that take, you know, and say, well, yeah, but we, that's not what was going to happen. I mean, they could very easily say, well, what happened to the populists? <laughs> you know, they said it wasn't going to happen either. What happened with them? And I mean, that's very rhetorical, but I think that that's a reality that people just need to acknowledge too. You know, when you when you talk about Marxism and revolutionary theory and things like that, there, you're, you're the the audience. You need to be aware of the audience, I suppose, and and maybe some of the ideas and preconceptions and life experiences that they've had too. And when you get into this populist thing of it's us versus them, it's easy to say it's us, and we've kind of gone over this a few times. But when you are, whatever the social, economic, political norm, default power, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I actually have talked about this when, when, when like trying to have a rational theory of like dealing with say the black political machine in Atlanta, which there are issues with, there are strong issues with, I mean, there, yeah. there's, but I've, I've, I've talked about ProPublica studies on things they've made to like, to protect black districts and stuff where it's empowered conservatives. But I've also pointed out, and I think this is important that there to think that it is purely cynical is wrong. That what a lot of what is going on there is exactly as you say, uh, these people came up, you think about the people around say John Lewis in Atlanta, right? Mm -hmm. They came up um, with SNCC, with the progressive coordinator, with the Panthers, with, 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 um, and all those all those things failed right 
Um, mm-hmm. like. I like my good my good story of the Panthers as much as anyone else, but all those things failed. If you're going to ask people to trust you, you already need a record of providing things that would benefit them. Yeah, and I know that's a hard ask. I realize that's a very hard ask because we're asking you know we're asking people to be like, uh, but dismissing people for for staying with, and this is actually true. With any, including working class people, frankly, like like working class quote working class white people, whatever. Yes. Um, if yep. some some people have asked me like, well, why don't they vote for progressives? And I'm like, well, when have pro- when have progressives actually delivered what they said? Yep. Like, so everybody in here, and and, and this is what I, and this is where maybe I th- I think is an interesting thing to think about when we talk about these movements, right? Everybody here has a reason why they believe what they believe, why they are hesitant for these these kind of flash pan movements. And the last 10 years, let, let's also be honest, have not convinced me that this is different than the prior ones going all the way back to McGovern um, in any significant sense, because we're still in the same holding pattern. Like, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of these marginal movements are much bigger. I mean, in regards to like the Sanders campaign, and that's and I do think that's important. Um, but there's also a sense in which like they haven't delivered anything, really. Um, and I know that's hard for people to to accept, but I'm like, well, if you're gonna argue with say the black political machine in South Carolina, um, and say well, your skepticism was, it, it, you know, it was just cynical. And then they go, well, look, you didn't do much. So how were we wrong? That's, Who the hell are you? Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, yeah. Like, I mean, like, let's get real. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, like, like that. And so what I, I think that the, the third thing I would say about a lot of this populism stuff is it, it really does try to fast track the hard and frustrating work of building up political or parapolitical coalitions, building yes. up workers' movements, dealing with movements that have diverse and opposed aims. And if you don't believe that movements have the thing. yeah if you don't believe <laughs> movements have diverse and opposed aims in a union, you've never been in a union meeting. Dude like it killed me. It <laughs> killed me when Dor had that conversation with Malpin. I mean I was in a union when I was 16 and it's not like look at me, but it's just the reality of like it's just not how you can tell when people don't know what they're talking about, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, you, with, with the us for STEM, uh, you know, you had said something that, that I wanted to touch on and, and I lost the train of thoughts, mm-hmm. but it doesn't, Oh, this is what I was going to say. You know, you, we're talking about like, I don't know what your ideology is or that ideology and audience is like, if you're a Marxist, you have a plan. You know, like, like what, and, and it doesn't, you, you could, you could be orthodox. You're just looking at Marx. You're looking at Lenin. You're looking at the Frankfurt school, whatever. There's like an idea there. That's yeah, not that, populism. Populism no. isn't that. And I think that in a way, trying to appropriate populism into something like Marxism is doing it a disservice, to be honest. You know, I, I, again, it's, it's a tool. It, it, it's not the thing. But I think you're right in that it's a shortcut and it's a very easy, it's a slogan, it's a bumper sticker. It's a story, it's a narrative, right? And in that story, the people, so whoever's listening, they're the protagonists, they're the good guys. The people who are the bad guys are the elites. Who are they? I don't know, you know, and that's the problem. You know, are we talking about international bankers? Are we talking about a Jewish conspiracy? Like, well, maybe both, right? But we have to get along, right? But yeah. are the British yeah. who are somehow also international bankers and Jewish conspiracy? I mean, like, yeah, like, yeah. like you start getting into what the floating signify of elite could mean, right? And you, and like I learned this from from being on the right wing, right? This is where I learned this from: is you never really like. I was dumb for years about like, well, I'm pissed off at elites. Okay, yeah, I was pissed off at elites. I thought I knew who they were referring to. And then I read an article by Joe Sobrin that was pushing Judeo Bolshevik conspiracies and basically saying, you know, protocols of the Elders of Zion shit. And I was like, 
what yeah. the fuck am I on? <laughs> like, where am look, I at? Look, look, look up who shot Huey Long, and you'll have a fun. Yeah, you'll have yeah. You'll, you'll have a very fun history lesson there about Jewish conspiracies and Zionism and stuff like that. Because he was going to keep us out of World War II, apparently, and Judeo Bolshevism, etc. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, it was. It, it's you get these you get these things, and you get these also this populist. That is also similar to fascists, where somehow both the far left, I mean, their view of the far left that's outside of them that won't play these games are also somehow a conspiracy against national interest, where, but also capitalism is bad. I mean, and then you have the fun stuff that was that you get out of Nazi circles where somehow the Jews are responsible for both capitalism and communism whole cloth. And you're just like, well, they're both they're both overpowerful and subhuman and that's and that is a trait of a lot of these elites and, and, and like i think i might be controversial and i don't think that you know i have a partial year script background so i don't think that anti-semitism is the only structural thing that does this I, that there's anti-chinese sentiment in places that do the same thing there's it's not unique but you you do see the structure where you focus on a middle tier of quote elites that is seen as an ethnic outsider and that's who you really focus on and you move the goal around as to who is the problem all right um is it uh, there's there's some weird marxists who are like well because uh gay households have a nominal income slightly higher than heterosexual outcomes that we should resurrect 1930s stalinist opinions about homosexuality yes. and and I, I i'm i'm like why are we giving these people time like any time at all um because right. one that first presumption is kind of a statistically misleading statement in the first place uh because it flattens out class differences between um people in the lgbtq uh the the, the queer community i it's easier to say that. Um, uh, it flounds out the class differences between them. It flounds out a whole lot of other concerns. Um, and yes, we can talk about like how sometimes different kinds of quote identity politics flatten out uh, distinctions between identity groups. Also true. But to to then demand that like, well, but what you should really do is flatten out the differences between you and the rest of the working class is, is a weird <laughs> ask because yeah, it's structurally yeah. the same uh, as what you're critiquing the, um, the, the identitarians is doing. Yeah. I mean, you have to ask these people like, okay, so what are you asking to do again? And who's, who's going to do this? How is this going to happen? You know? And right. then all of a sudden it sounds like, yeah, some familiar stuff. That's not great. Right. But I'm, I mean, there, there's other stuff, too. And yeah, I mean, I know that we're running up on time, but there's, you know, LeClau Le and Moff, you know, kind of have have an idea of structuralizing the concept of populism, which is kind of interesting, hmm. but like without doing like the lecture on it, I still feel like even if you try to take populism and make it, I guess, I guess you would say pluralistic, you know, that in, in the, the suggested methods that I've seen, right, as opposed to probably the best method, which would be horizontal, going back to the, the Grange and stuff like that. But from, from what I've seen, especially from LeClau, Le it, it still seems as if there's like a top-down approach to identifying the oppressions in society for people who might not be aware that they exist, for instance. And the idea of creating a story that unites people in common cause who might not otherwise feel that way. And there's like very, when, when it's presented, it makes sense. You know, when it's presented like women in, you know, during this time weren't concerned about patriarchy, but then when presented with the social oppression and inequality, then all of a sudden were, you know, but I mean, first, I, I kind of feel like that's manipulative in a weird way, <laughs> but 
I also think that it, 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 could, it feels like radical versions of Cass Sunstein, actually, in a weird way. Yeah, I mean, but 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 I, it also reeks. I feel like a BS, which is like uh, something that, um, and, and and there are probably people that have taken multiple classes on Laclau and and modern interpretations of populism. They're saying you're you're not framing it correctly. That's that's fine, but but still, it feels like when when you're trying to use populism, maybe outside of politics as a way of organizing, which I think probably, like in my subjective opinion, is more applicable. Um, there, there's still the the open possibility as since it is not like a preset theory that somebody's creating the story and that even if they're doing it in with good intention, that it can be sniffed out as BS, es especially if they're not of the group that has the legitimate grievance because then they, they're trying to project something upon people. I feel like that's where a lot of grievances from the left come in. And, and maybe this is where like some of the wokeism or fake, you know, stuff happens where, where, you know, they're saying, yeah, you're trying to, you're trying to be multicultural and include all these people, but you're just a social elitist too. You don't understand the problems. Mm -hmm. It feels like even someone like, like LeClau and, and even some of the more modern ways of interpreting methods of structuralizing populism have have issues as well you know i just and and maybe the more that i study populism the 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 more i'll come up with with positive takes on it i do think it's a useful tool but it, it seems like anytime you try to harness it into something beyond a method of organizing and projecting a message it just runs into immediate problems and the media problems just go to the fundamental core of it because it's a story, you know, right. but that's why it works because you're telling the people that they're the good people right. instead of being like, look at this is complicated, <laughs> which is to me reality, you know? Well, I find it funny when people claim, try to claim to be like hard economic or social, like I don't like it. I, I, I can I call myself a materialist. I am hesitant to say I'm an economic materialist because I actually think social reproduction is much larger than economics and blah blah blah. I have my reasons. It'll, I don't want to bore your audience with going on letters from Ingalls. But um I you know uh and I consider race, for example, uh part of that. Like and I I don't think that race is a proxy for class, but I also think that if you look at the emergence of modern race and the emergence of, and in the end of the late medieval period in Europe, transitioning into what we would see as the early versions of capitalist economy, you see it develop simultaneously as the class shifts into what something like we have today. Um, and so you can't disentangle them, but they're not the same. And it's very hard to tell other Marxists that particularly when you start talking about populism, because they want to reduce everything down to one factor that's very easy to talk about. And they want to do it essentially because it's an easy narrative, but it's a dishonest narrative a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, I, I also feel that way, frankly, when I hear stuff like going after like, oh, the white working class, blah, 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 is always racist. And I'm like, well, the actual history there is really complicated too. Like the, the, the history of labor in the United States is complicated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. the right working class was a construct built over like it really wasn't consolidated until the 1960s as an identity. Um, you know, I mean, and and when I talk about that, Marxists are like, oh, the, the working class. I'm like, yeah, but when we talk about like what we think about in America as the as the white dude in in the coveralls from the 1950s with the jackhammer, um, that image and who's included in that being everyone who's pale was not consolidated until basically it didn't exist anymore. Right. Um, you know, or, or was a very, I shouldn't say didn't exist, but it's a very small portion of the actual economy. Like right. we all know how like the Irish became white and the Italians became white and the Portuguese became white. But like you haven't really thought about what that means, right? And this and to say that we could just re reduce it to straight class is is dishonest. Now, I actually I will say I do think a lot of the times in liberal understandings, this class is left out. It's mis it's misunderstood. It's uh, it's 
promoted in a simple way. It's it's people have seized on these divisions to be cynical about it. But the thing is, everyone's cynical. Every every one of these movements has cynical moments. Like there's cynical moments and people in all of these movements. You need a bullshit detector on how to deal with them. Just because yeah. someone is nominally someone that claims itself a populist or a socialist, you should not necessarily trust them. And and this is back to our point about like like establishment black politics or whatever. Even if they don't like, even if a lot of these people, I don't like assuming that everyone involved is cynical, but I also don't like writing off that they, that they, that they might be. So even if we assume some of these... I'm pretty cynical. Yeah. Um, <laughs> even if we assume some of these black politicians in the Democratic Party are super cynical, we can't assume every one of their voters are. And what... Well, right, no. like... And no, you're, what... You, mm -hmm. You're doing... You're, I mean, it, it's, you know... The, the 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 negative critique of like neoliberals towards populism is that they're being anti-democratic by dismissing, even if the populist rhetoric is BS, the true grievances of the people who support it, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of the critique. You're not you. In this situ in this scenario, you would be doing the same to the people voting for whomever, right? The the black party machine, let's say. It's the same, it's the same process of of fundamentally being anti-democratic and pushing aside, right, people, regardless of your critique of the manifestation in which they're putting their energies and hopes onto, right? You're dismissing them along with whatever manifestation or critique that is too. And I, I think that's why it's hard for liberals to debate populists. I think that's why populism is also attractive to people on the left, you know? Um, the, the, when you grapple, it, it's hard to grapple with. You can't, you can't be like it. You know, you can't chase it because you're, you're going to be seen as a fake immediately. You know, you, you, you can't ignore it because then you play into the narrative of you're being an, an elite. Right. But you also can't just say it's all BS because you saying this policy is BS is just completely neglecting the people behind the policy too. Right. But if it sounds like this is kind of going both ways and in, in the way that you're describing this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. To, to me, this is the way I, I see it. And I think and I think that's why there's such an abuse of this 18 of the of this. I keep on saying 18th, 19th century history, the 1800s and yeah. the early 20th century, yeah. because if you flatten it out, you can you can come up with this alternative history of labor. And you know what? There's a lot of leftist darlings who I don't think have a populist bone in their in their body politically in the way we're talking about who still did this shit um uh for sure. like for sure uh i love howard zinn but he was definitely guilty of this like constructing a narrative that cleans up um the hard parts of the of the 19th and early 20th century it's very populist i mean right. you're creating and this is i guess this is my issue if you if you get to the heart this is the problem is that it's a story. It's not real, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and so either you need, you need to convince people that this is real when it's just not, it just fundamentally never is. It's, there's, it's always like what you said, whether it's Zen or it's, it's Paul Manafort, you know what I mean? Whether it's Trump or him working with the party of regions over in Ukraine or whatever, it's like, it, it's, you're, 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 you're creating a story. And that to me immediately is like a no-go, right? Be, because you don't have a theory, you don't have an economic, you don't have praxis. I mean, if you want to be a Marxist about it, there, there's just nothing there. It's it's right. it's like the void. And and people like Leclerc will debate, you know, materialists and Marxists and stuff and say, well, you can go. But, but to me, it's subjective. I, I might sound like an idiot, I, but it, it, again, it sounds like, yeah, but it's just a demagogue, you know, and it's just we're supposed to believe the demagogue, I guess. Um, and, and that you're going to be benevolent in, in this action. And like, I just don't, I'm not down with that. Right. I mean, I, yeah, I think if you're going to learn anything from the populist movement, it, it may be something like what Rodrigo Nunes is pushing and, um, uh, neither vertical nor horizontal, um, where, where you have to go out to people, meet them where they are, yep. organize with them, work with them, include yep. them in decision-making processes. But I guarantee you those decision-making processes will be highly contentious. Mm -hmm. They will they will be knocked down drag out fights because we have different interests, different backgrounds, and different histories. Yep. Like yep. Um, and 
you know, anyone who does identity uh, activism will probably tell you the same thing within their groups. They just probably you know, like like if you actually do this stuff, this is what's going to happen um, because w- there's a reason why we don't get along. And it's not just because the elites have fooled us like there, but it's easier. You know, it's easier to think that's populism, dude. That's the conspiracy. That's how you end up, you know, being on some Canadian truckers page talking about COVID vaccines and the W whatever, you know, but also having like a hammer and sickle in your profile and talking about Proudhon and Bakunin. And this is how like the mishmash happens. It feels like, you know, right. Uh, yeah, this is a whole nother topic where I can talk about right wing mis- uh, misappropriations of trucker <laughs> rebellions going back to like the 1960s. Yeah. It's like it's very yeah. it's weird because it happens yeah. a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. It literally happened in Canada with pipelines. I, but again, yeah, you know, yeah, we, yeah, it's yeah. it's ha- yeah. and it happened over Nixon, try, uh, Nixon and Carter trying to like push a mildly more responsible oil policy in the 70s. It yep. happened when when the when the CIA was trying to use the AFL-CIO to start a trucker strike to break up the AND government, like there's a long history of this. Does that mean truckers aren't aren't workers? Well, some are and some aren't actually. It's a, it's actually a very complicated scenario, right? But and, and and are all truckers right? No, but not all truckers also supported that stupid convoy. So no, yeah, again, <laughs> stop because I'll get yeah. Yeah, you can read about all this. unions and stuff in Canada too, and they had things to say, you know. Right. I mean, <laughs> like, um, it, it's it it's such a facile way to approach class politics, and it's a facile way to approach like to economic sure. amount analysis. It when I hear people talk about the PMC and they're like, "Well, really, it's like these." elites running the businesses who run everything so i'm like so you think the middlemen actually control the entire planet it's that just, makes no sense <laughs> and, and, and and this is i mean it, it's it's also like you mentioned in the beginning or kind of like a core piece of populism of conspiracies and and a lot of the conspiracies are insane i mean like you look at stuff that that um, Watson wrote about banks in the way that banks were unfair to farmers and anti-Semitism. <laughs> it's not too far off. Right. And, and you know, when, when people are using that rhetoric today, you can see how this could be a united force, but you also see how just so easily it bleeds into the people with very different ideas about the world agreeing somehow over the vagaries of a story um, of which the people aren't created, right? It's being mm. told to them it's easy. It's a shortcut. And it's very self-validating because you don't need to do anything. I, I can listen to a populist rhetoric and be like, this is great. You know, uh, we're the people, you know, us united. But I don't have to worry about certain things literally just because of how I look. You know, what I mean, and that's why it's great because I don't have to do any. self. I don't have to do any self critique. I'm the good guy. And so are you. And if and if you're telling me not, then you're dividing us. That's not reality. You know, it's self-validating and it's easy. It's dopamine, but that's not the, the true material, realistic world in which we live and, and how different systems work. Like you said, vertically, horizontally, et cetera. That's, it's, it's not the reality, but it's much easier. And it's a nice story. I'm the protagonist. I'm the good guy. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm going to, it's wrapping up and I yeah, know this yeah. is going to go to both our audiences and I'm going to give you the chance to also plug a few things. I am, uh, an ersatz intellectual, uh, meaning that I'm no longer an academic used to be, but uh, yeah. like like so many people uh, now <laughs> now do other stuff with my life because because yeah. uh, bad yeah. schooling policies. But um, I I wanted to to drop some books uh, cool. so that maybe people might find helpful for some of the things we're talking about. Um, and and they're not in agreement with one another also um so i think that's important uh one thing i will tell people is if you if you can't read and discern bias uh from multiple different sources you probably should not be talking about like uh being critical of things because that's literally what being critical means um i would say there's a book that on the stuff we talked about with the traditionalism and populism there's two of them um and one of them is Against the Modern World, uh, which is a 
book on traditionalism by Mark Sedwick. It came out in 2009 and it, it talks about Liminoff and Dugan and all these people, all these people who were marginal in the nineties and aughts. And we seem to can't shut up about now. Um, then goes into them. There's also another book that goes into this, these, the relationship between this and populism um, explicitly. And uh, that is, uh, what's that book called? Let me find it real fast. Um, the War for Eternity, um, the return of, of traditionalism, the rise of the populist right. Uh, uh, I think a, there's an earlier edition of the book that's mostly about Steve Bannon, but this, the second edition goes into all these movements. Um, I think that book, and it's by uh, Benjamin Tittlebaum. Uh, I think that book is really useful. Um, uh, I would say uh, a book by Francis Fukuyama. Yes, I know Francis Fukuyama is <laughs> is a problematic source for Marxists, but still, um, uh, liberalism and its discontents is actually quite useful for understanding some of this. And then um, for for something that's a slightly more critical and older, but about left populism there uh, that's more sympathetic would be um, uh, three books by Christopher Lash, uh, uh, The World of Nations, um, The Agony of the American Left, and uh, uh, The True and Only Heaven, um, which, which uh, the last book is pro-populist. The other two books are way more critical but we'll give you some of what's at stake here. And then if you can find, if you find a good history of American populism um, and read it, and there's a bunch, uh, I would read that over Tom Frank. Although some of the Tom Frank stuff isn't terrible. Just read it with the, he is doing what we're complaining about. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lens. Um, what uh i'd also uh tell people to check out um know your enemy and i don't speak german and um uh, your podcast uh, the right podcast for getting an idea of of what's going on contemporarily and how it's all shaking out i would also say focusing on while we have talked about fourth position theory and some of these weird obscure groups there is a sense in which uh sometimes people get lost in that and miss like obvious shit. Like uh, I think um, bigger movements like the national conservative movement for weirdo movements, like the alt-right, um, which is not to say the alt-right isn't dangerous. wasn't dangerous. It's just that on, on, on order of scale, uh, the national conservative movement has a lot more money and a lot more power and a lot more establishment figures behind them. Um yeah. And they are doing some of what we're talking about, too, um, using populist rhetoric to muck up the difference between left agendas, left agendas and right agendas. Um, so that's what I would tell people. And so what would you like to plug, Rob? Yes, in in the new year. So so upcoming, uh, I'll be back on. Um, I don't speak German talking about ba basically right wing populism. So it won't be all of this, but it's going to be more focused on the 90s, patriot movements, writings of people like Eric Rudolph, who, uh, you know, that and, and, and the stuff that I do, that mm -hmm. is actually kind of where I started was was in, the, in, in that how the 90s militia movements, terrorists became mainstreamed, basically, and and going up through the Tea Party and, and MAGA. But. And then I guess the Oath Keepers, if you want to bring all the way to January 6th. But um, so so that will be forthcoming down the road. For people who are listening, um, again, I stay amorphous on, on political stuff because I have a, a broad audience. I'll talk about anarchist critiques. I'll talk about Marxist critiques, whatever. Or if you want to talk about Democrats, like that's cool. Um, but maybe for your audience, there are there is a, a debate between the Clow and Zizek out there on YouTube in which the idea of populism, us versus them, right, with some structure around it occurs. And and I'm sure your folks know, you know, that it would be against like a materialistic, you know, kind of more classical Marxist clash conscious view of 
of um, you know conflict. So mm -hmm. uh, that might be something that folks would be interested in in seeing. It would do a better job of describing the more academic or rhetor or theoretical kind of uh, justification of populism, especially 1980s, 1990s. Um, they don't agree, of course, but but it might be that, that might add some context to some of the things that, that we were talking about. Yeah, I would I would definitely suggest that. I, I uh, to any listeners who felt like we went everywhere, yeah, yeah, sorry, uh, I do that to people though. Yeah, <laughs> um, I kind of do too. So I was actually a little when when we were talking about this, I'm like, we're gonna have a hard time staying down on this topic. So right, but, um, we got it. <laughs> yeah, and and it's funny because. It, we're doing this uh, um, on a day where I just went on a long rant about liberals because of the railroad strike. But you know what? I'm not positing populist shit because it's just it's, yeah. it's, it's not real. Like it is not. It, it, I mean, like you could argue that most political frameworks that will. But it it's I think if there's any big takeaway from this, if it's people ask you to be vaguer. It's it's a rhetorically good strategy. It's terrible actual politics. And yeah, man. and that's true from the 99 versus the 1% rhetoric from Occupy. That's true from Howard's End to People's History. That's true. It's true across the board. Like, like you need yeah. to deal with the difficulties and complications of this history. And it's yeah. not easy. Nope. Nope. If you're not, I would just, I guess this would be the last. If you're not in a group that is already disenfranchised or among the first in line, if it goes down, try to empathize and put yourself in that situation and then reevaluate what it is that you're looking at. And, and, and you don't need to agree, but maybe have some empathy and understanding at least, because that's solidarity too, you know, about, well, where's the hesitancy coming from? You know, what, what do I need to do to approach this differently to better understand where other folks are coming from as opposed to just scapegoating and name calling and generalizing? I mean, you're just doing what the right's doing at that point. Yep. That's a great last point to end on. Thank you so much for coming on and people should check out your show, The Right Podcast, which is available for sure on YouTube. Is it available on other stuff? I'll yeah, man. You can find it on podcast form too. YouTube's better because I, I put graphics up. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's charts and graphs, but you can get it on, on pods too everywhere. All right. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon. Thanks, dude. So.